Hey there travelers, Traveling Irishman here. Today we're in Jerome, Arizona. More particularly, we're here at the Douglas Mansion, which is in Jerome State Historic Park. And here, they, this built mansion behind me was built in 1916 by a guy named Jimmy Douglas for the Little Daisy Copper Mine, which is down below. And to the left, or to the right of me, I should say, was the Little Daisy Hotel that they had built for the miners and investors back then. We're gonna go ahead and take a tour of it and show you how it is. The Douglas Mansion is a museum which is devoted to the Jerome area and the Douglas family. The museum features exhibits of photographs, mining artifacts, and minerals in addition to a video presentation and a 3D model of the town with its underground mines. Well, travelers, a little history about the Douglas family. They worked in a rough and tumble world of Arizona mining, but their influence spread from the Arizona Territory to international politics. From Dr. James Douglas Ventures in Jerome to Lewis Douglas in Washington, D.C., the Douglas family has influenced life in Arizona. The Douglas Mansion, built by James Stewart Douglas, is a reminder of a family that built a fortune of copper mining but gave back in public service. Douglas designed the house as a hotel for mining officials and investors as well as for his own family. It featured a wine cellar, build room, marble shower, steam heat, and much ahead of its time, a central vacuum system. Douglas was mostly proud of the fact that his house was constructed of adobe bricks that were made on the site. This house is the largest adobe structure in Arizona today. Montana Hotel that's depicted in this picture was built in 1900 by the United Verde Copper Company to house employees. A fire gutted in it in 1915 and the remains were blasted with dynamite. At the time, it was Arizona's largest and most luxurious hotel consisting of 200 rooms, a huge dining room, a large lobby, and beautiful copper chandeliers. Jerome is located on several geological faults crossed by some 88 miles of tunnels. The tunnel blasting had started in 1924, which aggravated an already precarious situation. By late that year, some of the buildings had noticeably shifted. Money was plentiful during the 1920s, and the town had boomed with activity. As more buildings have come to the shifting earth, they were torn down and replaced. By 1931, however, the depression had hit Jerome hard. Construction slowed to a halt while slide activity had grew. <music> Jerome
Jerome's founders were concerned and brought a damage suit against the United Verde and Little Daisy Mines. Both companies contributed some financial support in and out of court settlement, but Jerome's boom years were over. Hundreds of buildings were destroyed and the town never did regain its former splendor. There were two major mines in Jerome, the United Verde Mine, which was owned by William Andrews Clark. Clark had made millions from the mine and became one of the richest men in America. Clark had created a financial empire and he was known as an unscrupulous and fearless investor, making money as a miner, merchant, banker, and a railroad magnate. In 1862, at the age of 23, Clark had headed to Colorado to mine for gold. Next, he moved to Montana, where he found that selling supplies to miners was more lucrative than actually mining. Clark had purchased the United Verde mine in 1889. Because of his financial success in Montana, Clark had the money to establish railroad lines and build a smelter, making the mine profitable. The United Verde mine became the single richest privately owned mine in America. In Nevada, Clark is considered the founder of Las Vegas. While the springs in the area were used by farmers for many years, it was Clark's Railroad that brought prosperity to the area and Clark County was then established. In the Verde Valley, the copper mines in Jerome drove a demand for electrical power. In 1902, the Arizona Power Company was formed to build two hydroelectric plants on Fossil Creek near the base of Mongolian Rim. The company struggled until 1907 when William Andrews Clark, the owner of one of the mines in Jerome, agreed to buy one-third of the power coming from the company. Clark had been generating his own power at great expense with imported coal and oil. When World War I started in 1914, metals including copper were in demand. In 1915, James S. Douglas began the development of the United Verde Extension Mine, which produced 10 million in copper, silver, and gold in 1916. These events drove a need for more electrical power. TAPCO started construction of a new plant named the TAPCO Steam Generating Plant north of Clarkdale. This portable air brake tester, which is shown here, was used to test for faulty brakes on railroad cars. Compressed air contained in the tank, which was fed into each railroad car's brake system and then measured for leakage. Electric locomotives arrived in the west in the 1890s after being used in coal mines in the east and the Appalachians starting around 1887. Because electric locomotives required special mechanical and electrical engineering, western mines were slow to take them up. The early models were too large for metal mining and very expensive to buy and operate. They also required heavier rails to run on. Here are the water pumps. Water was frequently a problem in the underground mines. Tunnels had to be outfitted with pumps to get rid of the water. Because the water carried a lot of abrasive solids, the pumps needed to be designed to handle it with minimum upkeep. They were available in a range of sizes. This is what's called a slusher hoist. A slusher hoist is a consisted of a scraper and a double drum hoist. One cable is attached to the front of the scraper so the blade can be pulled towards the hoist and an oar pass. The second cable goes around a block securely fastened in the timber framing or wall of the shaft and is attached to the back of the scraper. By pulling on the cables, the scraper can be moved back and forth 
scraping the material into an ore car or a skip. Dr. Douglas came to Arizona to scout mining properties for Phelps and Dodge Trading Company. In his role as a scout, he traveled the territory exploring mining claims, sometimes using this buggy. Smokey Joe started out in 1929 as a Ford Model A four-door sedan. Joe Larson purchased it from Tipton Motors of Jerome. A fire in 1950 ended the life of the car when flames spread from the Jerome Lumberyard to Joe's garage, which was located across the street. Joe gave the burned-out car to another Jerome resident, Jim Cambruzzi. Jim needed a pickup for his various jobs and decided to turn the sedan into a truck. He and his cousin Forrest took old mining timbers and a wash tub and a bed from a Model T to create the pickup. It was further spruced up with copper and a black paint job. They named it the Smokey Joe in tribute to the car's first owner, Joe Larson. Well, travelers, that completes our tour here at the Douglas Mansion as well as the Jerome State Historic Park. Hope you guys like this video. If you guys like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed to our channel, please subscribe to our channel. There's more content along the way as well as our other videos. Have a great time. Safe travels. We'll see you guys on the next episode.